Okay, we're about ready to begin. Grab a seat. Uh, by the way, there's a prayer request for uh, Lauren and Margaret uh, Matsky. They live in Mankato, Minnesota. Uh, Lauren, some of you know them. They've been uh, with us for many, many years. Uh, and he's been in the hospital lately, not doing so well. Uh, kind of came on suddenly, so um, anyway, if you, uh, they are requesting prayer, so we'd appreciate that. Uh, Lauren Matsky, M A T Z. Z K E. Thought there might be an S in there somewhere. <laughs> okay. I want to talk today a little bit about the courtroom, the courtroom in heaven. Um, this is a fairly new idea, although we've talked about it really for about 22 years now. Um, it has been very interesting to me that uh, uh, just really in the last year we've begun to hear about many others who have uh, who have had, uh, you might say, courtroom experiences. Uh, they've been getting in revelation about the divine court. Uh, back in 1993, when we began our Jubilee prayer campaign, uh, in November of 93, I assumed at the outset that this would be like, you know, pictured like warfare, you know, out in the open battlefield type of thing. You know, you're swinging the sword of the spirit or in my case, a battle axe. And that was my weapon of choice. Uh, you know, and because years earlier, by the way, in 1983, I'd asked, I'd always seen myself with a battle axe and I always wondered what that was. So I asked the father one day, what, what, what's a battle axe? You know, and he says, with signs following. And I thought, hmm, takes a while to ponder that one and see what that is. But anyway, uh, in 93, uh, when we began this prayer campaign, it turned out to be 13 years long, I, uh, I was surprised from the beginning how easy it was. And I was wondering, why is it so easy? You know, I mean, we were just, but I realized we were presenting our case against Babylon in, the, in a court of law. It wasn't out on a, settling it on a battlefield it was in a court of law. And basically what you do in a court of law is you remove the legal rights of your opponent so that you can bind him effectively. Too often what we've done is gone against the enemy and we're out there binding the enemy, but we don't realize that that enemy has rights. We give him rights when the nation turns from God and follows false gods. When we follow false gods and when we, and sin in general, empowers the enemy to enslave us. And this is all done by the law of God. They have legal rights to do it because the, the, the enemy is actually God's agent of judgment. And he does it according to biblical law. And so you see all through scripture, when Israel uh, sinned, when they, when they, started following false gods, what happened? God says that he sold them into the hands of these other nations. Well, that's the judge in a courtroom selling them into slavery because of their sin. What happens is, uh, this terminology comes from Exodus 22, verse 3, where uh, if a thief is caught and he's convicted of sin, then he has to pay restitution. But if he doesn't have restitution, if he cannot make good on the debt, 
then he is to be sold for his theft. And so we see this all through the book of Judges, where God says he, he, will, he has sold them into the hands of the king of Mesopotamia. In Judges 3, 8, I think it is. And then, uh, you know, and later you see this in, in chapter 4 of Judges, where he sold them into the hands of the king of Canaan. And later he sold them into the hands of the Philistines. And this is legal terminology. This is not about a battlefield. This is about a court of law. And so it's helpful for us to know and understand that, uh, uh, that, our, uh, that a, a good share of our um, work and ministry and focus really should be in, in a divine court setting rather than out on a battlefield. A battlefield is something where you enforce the law that has already been decreed. But you need to go and get the decree first. You need to get the ruling first so that you have legal grounds to stand upon so that you're on the right side when you're coming against the enemy. Because when you're coming against the enemy, you need to have God on your side. And God is the great judge of all creation. And if you want to know what a judge does, you've got to read the law. You find out that he's got to be impartial in all of his ways. That means the, that means the devil himself gets equal treatment under the law. And that's why when, Mo, when, uh, when uh, Michael was contending with the devil for the body of Moses, you see, what do you mean? How, how does this work? This is in a court of law. And in, uh, uh, in Isaiah uh, 43, verses 26, Put me in remembrance, God says. Let us plead together. You're pleading a case. You know, get together and plead your case in a court. Declare thou, or, or state your case, that thou mayest be justified. You get your rights if you state them in a court of law because that is what a judge has to go on. He, a judge is limited by the testimony that is presented to him, even if obviously the judge of the whole earth knows everything already. But he has, in, in his judge capacity, he has limited himself so that, that the testimony uh, has to be accurate and the testimony uh, has to be in favor of whatever verdict he does. And so when we come before uh, the divine court, we need to know the law. You need to know uh, the, the law and you need to know the case. You need to know the, the facts in the case. And the, the great part of it is that we can always win the case. There is always a way to win your case. Most people, however, do not win their case because first of all, they don't know they're in a court of law. So they, you know, they come in and they, they come in screaming and binding the devil and so on. And the bailiff just takes them out of court. You're out of order. It is not about how loud you scream. That may work on a battlefield, but it doesn't work in a courtroom. Okay? And so we need to know what our authority is. We need to know the procedure. We need to know how to present the case properly before the Lord. And then we can get the proper ruling and then we can act upon it. And when we can act upon it, we often find that the enemy does not want to comply with the decree from the court. And then you might want to go into spiritual warfare on a battlefield to actually enforce that. But these, this is the proper order that we need to understand. We have many examples of this uh, through Scripture uh, where God tells us to, uh, uh, to do these various things. Now, uh, the, let's see. I want to read to you a little bit from a book uh, by Jeanette Strauss. It's called From the Courtroom of Heaven. 
Uh, the full title of it is From the Courtroom of Heaven to the Throne of Grace and Mercy. This is a very interesting little booklet. It just came out in 2011. And uh, I was a little bit surprised to read it and found out uh, how she got the revelation about the divine court. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. Where do we start? She writes here uh, that we are ambassadors of heaven. You know, she gets this from 2 Corinthians 5, is it? Uh, where God is calling us ambassadors. Now, ambassadors are political, but, but it's based upon uh, legality. There are certain legalities about it. You have a legal position where you are representing somebody else. And as an ambassador, we are representing Christ. So whatever we speak, our job is to make sure we only speak the policies of the one who has sent us. And we need to speak it accurately and in the proper attitude. Because we need to be of the character of the one who sent us, which is love. And so, you know, it's quite interesting. Uh, uh, yesterday, was it yesterday? We went to uh, see Jonah, the big pageant over here. And uh, you know the story of Jonah. He was a, the so-called reluctant prophet. He was sent with a message that he didn't want to deliver. Um, well, he, he wanted the deliverance, or he wanted to deliver the message, yet 40 days in Nineveh shall be overthrown. Well, that was fine. He was a good nationalist, you know, and he wanted to see Nineveh overthrown. The problem was he didn't want Nineveh to repent. So he's, he's one of the few prophets that God actually allowed to be successful. But he wasn't happy with his success. It's kind of funny, you know. All the other prophets wish they were successful. And they all end up getting killed, you know. <laughs> and so it's, it's quite an interesting scenario. So if, you're, if you feel like you're ever successful, uh, you might say... What's going on? Okay. Uh, but um, the one thing that came out toward the end of that uh, pageant was when, the, when Jonah was told by the repenting people of Nineveh in this play that uh, you, you were willing to give the message, but you did not speak the truth in love. I thought that was a good little statement. Yeah. I think they caught the essence of the story. And of course, uh, you know, I sort of take that personally too, you well, know. Sure. So, uh, you know, it's about truth and love. And so, um, anyway, here's what uh, Jeanette has to say. I'm gonna read a few things to, it, to you because uh, I believe that she's really, she too has, caught the essence of this. She says, as intercessors, we can bring situations into the heavenly courtroom for resolution. The opportunity to appear and defend ourselves in this courtroom is a privilege and honor that is available to every believer. The opportunity to appear as an intercessor is also welcomed by the judge, but not by the prosecuting attorney. <laughs> now you know that uh, uh, Satan means uh, an adversary. And basically it's an adversary in a court of law. It's the prosecuting attorney. Uh, the word devil means accuser. So devil, Satan, these are legal terms actually. And so when, uh, whether you sin or not, the prosec prosecuting attorney is there in the divine court to accuse you. He is the accuser of the brethren. We really should not take on his job. There's already somebody up there taking on that job. You don't need that role, okay? We need to be on the other side of the courtroom seeing what the advocate or the, uh, the uh, defense attorney 
is talking about and how he is counseling the defense. And if you follow the advice of, the, of your advocate, the Holy Spirit, uh, you'll find that you can, there is always a way to win your case. He's the best. He never loses a case. He's absolutely the best at it. Because even if you're absolutely guilty, which most people are, by the way, um, if you're absolutely guilty, there is still a way to be acquitted. You repent. Confess the sin. And then you have the right to put it under the blood of Jesus and say, it's been paid for. You can't, you can't prosecute twice for the same sin. It's gone. And so there's always a way around it. But if you don't follow your, the advice of your defense attorney, you might want to defend yourself by saying, but I'm a good guy. Look at all the good things I did. And the judge will simply tell you, those good things are irrelevant for this case. The problem is, what did you do in this particular case? Now, all the good in the world can't erase the bad things that you did. That's not how you win your case. You win your case because Jesus Christ has already paid for the sin that you did. And if you, by faith, uh, and by your statement in the divine court, you put that under the blood of Jesus and say, he has already paid for it, you can't hang a man twice for the same crime. So there's always a way to win your case, no matter how guilty you are. And the amount of guilt doesn't even factor into it. It's not relevant. Because there is no sin that is too great where Jesus couldn't handle it on the cross. There is no debt that is too great that the blood of Christ cannot pay for it. Because his blood is worth a whole lot more than your sin. I don't care if you're the biggest sinner in the world. Sorry, Paul already took that position. But <clears throat> there is, there's no way that anybody's sin, or even the sin of the whole world, added together, could ever come close to overwhelming the value of the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's why when he said on the cross... Father, forgive them. He had the right as a victim to forgive sin. The judge cannot forgive sin because that does injustice to the victims. But the victim has every right to forgive that which has been done to him. Jesus took upon himself the sin of the whole world. And therefore, he had the right to forgive the sin of the whole world as well. And when people don't understand the legality of this, they don't comprehend it, they think that if we say God is going to save all mankind, the immediate reaction is, well, there's two reactions, but one is, well, then you're just trampling on the blood of Jesus. And I'm saying, what? What do you mean? I'm saying that the blood of Jesus is greater in value than the sin of the whole world has in liability. How does that blaspheme the blood of Jesus? Seems to me that if you say that Jesus' blood cannot save everyone, then it seems to me you're degrading the value of the blood of Jesus. Secondly, of course, they say, well, no, uh, it only works if somebody responds and, and does this. Well, that's a half-truth. It's actually the case. The blood of Jesus does not apply to anybody unless they, uh, un unless they state it in the divine court. Now, so the question is, will they or will they not? I say they will. Because the scripture says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, they're not going to all do it in this lifetime. 
Here's where we run into the next problem. Death is a deadline. The big buzzer sounds, nobody gets in after that. So they all come before the great white throne in the future and, uh, and you know, and they see all this stuff and they, and they all want to repent and God says, sorry, too late. Now where in the world does it say that in scripture? There is never any too late. God does not bring people to the place where every knee bows and every tongue confesses and then says, eh, too late, it doesn't count anymore. It's not how it works. They come before the great white throne judgment because this is a legal case and every knee will bow and every one tongue will confess. And, uh, and that word confess uh, is a very interesting word. I don't know, am I going to steal Mark's thunder on this? On this word? You going to talk about that? Where's Mark? Okay, well, maybe I'll run to it real quick here then. Um, get it said before he can respond. Um, uh, let's see here. Yeah, every tongue will confess. To confess, you look it up in the dictionary, um, which I finally did after many, many years of not doing that. <clears throat> see, I was raised at, you know, confess, yes. The angels will shove, your, shove you down on your knees and uh, force your lips to go this way and your mouth to go that way and uh, will juggle your, your uh, voice box so that you will confess whether you like it or not. Just before he throws you in hell. <laughs> but the word confess, if you look it up, it means to acknowledge openly and joyfully and agree fully. That's what it means. Joyfully. That's a key part of that word to confess. To acknowledge openly and joyfully and agree fully. That is what will happen when every knee bows and every tongue acknowledges Christ openly and joyfully and is in full agreement with him. Now, how do you get to that position and not get some results out of it? I agree that most people will not do it in this lifetime. That's fine. But there is no divine buzzer that's, that, uh, you know, once that goes off, oh, deadline, you know, the game show is over. Your answers are correct, but it doesn't count. This is not what scripture says. The only thing that is ever quoted on that is in Hebrews where it says, um, it's, it's appointed unto man once to die and after this the judgment. Well, very true. You know, we, we die and after we die, then, then there's this great white throne judgment. That's true. But where does this say anything about the deadline? Where does it say anything about death being a deadline where you cannot confess him after that? Because if, if you can't confess him after that, then Philippians, uh, Philippians 2.11 isn't going to take place where every knee bows and every tongue confesses. See? So if, it can, if it's not going to happen in this lifetime, when will it happen? It's got to happen afterwards, right? I mean, that seems logical to me. And so, anyway, um, uh, let's see, I get off on that. Uh, Psalm 65, 4. Blessed is the man you choose and cause to approach you, that he may dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, of your holy temple. It's God who causes us to come to him, approach him, and this is in the courts. Well, we can come into God's courtroom and know we will be heard because our sins have been paid for through the shed blood of Jesus on the cross at Calvary. His blood has the power to wash our sins away. And so, uh, Anyway, then she says, I've heard it said we aren't living under the law but under grace. And she says, Paul addresses this subject when writing to the New Testament believers in Rome. Romans 6, 14 and 15, Amplified. 
For sin shall not or any longer exert dominion over you, since now you are not under law as slaves, but under grace as subjects of God's favor and mercy. What then? What are we to conclude? Shall we sin because we live not under law, but under God's favor and mercy? Certainly not. Do you not know that if you continually surrender yourselves to anyone to do his will, you are the slaves of him whom you obey, whether that be to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness, right doing and right standing with God. We live under God's grace as long as we are obedient to the laws of the kingdom of heaven. The Lord has extended his grace to us, but as the word says, we can remove ourselves from this grace through various sins. And of course, she goes on to explain that, that you know, when we sin, then we, you know, we need to, we, we f essentially fall out of a, a position of honor in the court, okay? And that's a legal term. And we need to run to the courtroom and, you know, and reestablish that connection and relationship so that we remain in honor in the court. And then we have, you know, we have full and free access uh, and we are unhindered then by the accusations of the accuser. Because you can bet on it, anytime you do anything wrong, the accuser is there to accuse you. But we have, we, we have an advocate uh, who can teach us how to, um, how, to, how to defend ourselves in a court of law. Because an advocate is a helper. A helper is an assistant or a counselor, uh, our attorney that tells us and gives us the way to win our case. Okay. Now, in chapter three of uh, Jeanette's book, she talks about, uh, she, it's, it's entitled The Dream. <clears throat> and this is how she got the revelation of the divine court. She said, after seven years of praying for our daughter Stacy's backslidden spiritual condition, my husband Bud and I had become discouraged and frustrated. She was a born again, Bible believing Christian who had gradually faded away from her Christian values and way of life. Even if a Christian is not walking with the Lord, they probably know what, what they're doing is wrong. They may still confess Jesus as their Savior, but they don't very often attend church or read the Word because it literally convicts them of their sins. They move themselves out of the kingdom of light where the Lord is king, into a kingdom of darkness where Satan rules and enslaves. This was the case with our daughter. We prayed every way we knew how, we pleaded and decreed scripture to the Lord. We addressed the enemy. We commanded and demanded the release of our daughter. We bound Satan up in the name of Jesus, probably many times, my commentary. We claimed the blood of Jesus over her. We did this for years without any visible results. We felt like we were beating against the wind. We weren't prepared for the test this would turn out to be for us. We thought we had done most everything right in raising her, but at times we blamed ourselves for her backslidden state. We have found that this is common in Christian families. Parents have done their best to raise the child properly, but the child chooses to go the way of the world. We know that children have to find their own way, which can be a heartrending time for the parents. For Stacy's sake, we wish it wouldn't have happened, but the Lord was faithful to her. He brought her back as he promised us in his word he would do. He will be faithful in your situation too. One night while we were praying for her, out of frustration and some fear, I admit, we asked the Lord for a new strategy of prayer for her. I think the Lord was waiting for that prayer because he answered it that very night. This is the account of the dream that followed our prayer. In the dream, Stacy and I, that's mother and daughter, were standing in a long, wide hallway. She asked me if I would help her. I told her I would and asked what she needed. She pointed to a door in the hallway, which probably represented her heart, and asked if I would go in and get her things that were in the room. She said she couldn't go into the room because someone was watching the room, and if they saw her, they would catch her and kill her. 
I walked over to the door, opened it a crack, and looked in. I saw a small, dimly lit room. Directly across from the door, on the other side of the room, there was a large window that was letting in muted light. I saw only one piece of furniture, a bed that took up most of the room. The clothes she had asked me to get were scattered all over the bed, and on the other side of the window I could see people standing around with beer bottles in their hands, smoking and laughing. I could hear loud music. It appeared to be a worldly party scene. I opened the door a little wider and slid through the opening. I began to gather up her clothes. And as I was doing this, I kept glancing at the window. There was a person on the other side of the window. He was talking with several others, standing with his back to the window. He must have sensed something was going on behind him because he suddenly turned around and looked into the room directly at me. As our eyes locked, he stepped right through the glass of the window and was instantly standing in front of me. This person, or spirit, placed a hand on either side of my face and began to twist my head. I knew his intention was to break my neck to kill me. I raised my hands up and knocked his hands loose, but he grabbed my hands and held them together in front of me, placing me in a position of helplessness. I heard these words echoing loudly through my mind, spoken by the Holy Spirit. Your daughter is a lawful captive of the enemy. Her case is in my court. Stand in the gap and repent on behalf of sin committed against me by her and ask my forgiveness for the sin. Petition me, the righteous judge of heaven and earth, to move her case from the courtroom of judgment into the throne room of grace and mercy for a season of grace on her life where I will remove the veil from the eyes of her understanding and show her truth. Then I heard more words vibrate loudly within my inner man. The voice said, Isaiah 49, 24, and 25. These last words woke me up. My mind was rapidly trying to process what had just occurred. I ran through the dream in my mind, preparing to go into this spiritual courtroom as the dream had instructed me. It occurred to me that before I went into the courtroom of heaven on anyone's behalf, I'd better be spiritually clean before the judge myself. <coughs> I quickly prayed a prayer of repentance. In my mind, I saw myself standing before a large bench with a judge sitting behind it. I said, Lord, if there is any sin in my life, I repent and ask your forgiveness. I ask that you would move me from the court of judgment to the throne room of grace and mercy and remove any veils that have been over my eyes, the eyes of my understanding, so that I might see your truth in every area of my life. Thank you for setting me free and showing me your truth. Amen. As I finished my prayer, I saw myself standing once again in a courtroom before a large bench with a judge sitting behind it. His hand was extended to me. See, that indicates uh, restoring honor, where you're, you're, you're recognized by the court. Um, I had a manila file in my hand that I, I saw had the name Stacy Strauss on it. I extended my hand to give him the file. He took the file and smiled at me, nodding to encourage me. I continued, I'm here to stand in the gap for my daughter, Stacy. I repent on behalf of any sin that she is committing against you. I ask your forgiveness on behalf of her sin. See, this is all about the principle of an intercessor where we take upon ourselves the liability for their sin and repent for it on behalf of the other person. And then, you know, this principle of repenting on the behalf of other people this is, this is the essence of intercession. And we have the authority to do it. And it's a very, very powerful tool. <clears throat> now, there's many different courtrooms, by the way. And so, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot to be learned in this type of thing. As I said this, I thought about the scripture in Daniel 9, where Daniel stood in the gap for the Hebrew people, repenting on behalf of national sin. He included himself among the guilty. So I continued, I ask that she be moved from the courtroom of judgment to the throne room of grace and mercy 
for a season of grace in her life. I ask you to remove the veil from the eyes of her understanding so that she will see and embrace your truth. I ask you to extend this season of grace for as long as it takes for her to see the truth and embrace it. Then I thank the Lord for the dream and for how he was going to move on her behalf. I asked if I could be excused. He smiled and nodded. I looked at the clock. It was 4.30 a.m. I immediately got out of bed and went out into the living room and opened my Bible and read Isaiah 49, 24, and 25, which was, of course, the last scripture given to her in the dream. And it says, Shall the prey be taken from the mighty or the lawful captive delivered? But thus saith the Lord, Even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away, and the prey of the terrible shall be delivered. For I will contend with him that contendeth with thee, and I will save thy children. Pretty good verse to get in a dream, huh? Not bad. You can imagine my excitement as I read this very personal scripture that had come as a direct answer to our cry to the Lord. It had never occurred to us to see her from God's viewpoint as a lawful captive. The dream and the results we experienced from following the instructions given by the Lord have changed the way I pray about every situation. Now as I pray and take each prayer request into the courtroom of heaven, I have a visual of my prayer going before the throne of God, and my faith is increased. I hope my experience will help increase your faith so that you can believe that God wants to settle the open cases in your life and give you resolution and victory. Amen. Now, what's interesting is uh, she goes on to, to tell us that, uh, you know, she had gotten up at morning and was looking up these verses and uh, not realizing that her daughter was driving by and saw the light on and dropped in. She was going to work and uh, normally, you know, she just drove on past the house, but she saw the light on, so she decided to come on in. And so her mother told her the dream. <clears throat> and, uh, and once, uh, you know, and at that point she acknowledged it. <clears throat> and uh, gave her a hug and, and left. And not a whole lot happened, not right then. But she had gotten the witness. She, she knew what it was. And it wasn't too long, it was some time later, before, before she did get delivered. And uh, the Lord brought her through uh, some uh, difficult circumstances to show her that this was this lifestyle that she was in was killing her and so she wanted to come out and so she came came back home and that was the point where her daughter asked her mother to go with her to go and pick up a few things from the place where she was staying uh, parent I, I take she I take it that she was living with somebody at that point and and then when they got there she wanted to pick up her stereo set or whatever and um, but when they got there to the parking lot, she just felt like, yeah, don't feel comfortable with this. So she said, I'm just going to leave it behind. Let's go on back home. And so essentially her life changed completely. And, um, and that changed her life. So she says an ambassador is a representative of government. As ambassadors for Jesus Christ, we represent the government of God. There are specific God-given laws that govern the kingdom of heaven. We will be looking at those laws of liberty, not legalism or man-made religious laws, but spiritual legal strategies that will help believers live a more victorious life. We can be thankful that as humble intercessors, we aren't required to have expertise or training in the earthly legal system to present a case in the courtroom of heaven. The Holy Spirit says he will direct our mouths as to what to say when we are presenting our case. For I will give you a mouth and a wisdom which all of your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. Luke 21:15. 15. 
The Lord is a God of redemption and reconciliation. He has many different ways to redeem a person from the clutches of the enemy. One way would be through the prayers of an intercessor, an ambassador of reconciliation, who is equipped with the legal power of attorney given by Jesus Christ to act on his behalf. And then quotes from Job 22, 30, he will even deliver one who is not innocent. Yes, he will be delivered by the purity of your hands. That's an amazing verse. Job 22, 30. As ambassadors of reconciliation, we enter the courtroom equipped with the legal power of eternity, eternity, power of attorney. You said it right. Yeah. We have the power of eternity given to us by Jesus Christ to act on his behalf. Even so, there is an order to the court proceedings and rules that must be obeyed. As ambassadors, we have to respect the position of the prosecuting attorney, the accuser, who is at times described as a principality or power. The definition of a principality is the position, legal, or uh, legal jurisdiction or territory of a prince. No matter how badly we want to direct righteous indignation toward him, we must keep our wits about us. We are there to plead for mercy and grace and then justice. The only way, uh, I like that too, because you know, mercy triumphs over justice. Yeah. James tells us. The only way to obtain justice against him is to do it by the written word. We might add the spoken word too, revelation, but it, it, you just write it down and then it's the written word. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> we'll always get around that little thing. <clears throat> Our mentor, Jesus, was able to keep his cool when conversing with Satan. The Lord is not ruffled in the least by him. The word says that the Lord is over every principality and power. They are created for his purposes and they are subject to him. Okay, it's about sovereignty. For by him were all things, uh, all things were created, they're in heaven or in earth, visible or invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. Colossians 1.16. In the desert, when the enemy came to Jesus with temptations, he answered by quoting scripture and saying, it is written. Scripture seems to imply that Jesus answered in, in a matter-of-fact civil tone. He didn't dispute, rebuke, or yell at Satan. He wasn't disrespectful. Jesus simply quoted the scripture, and when the enemy was done tempting him, he left. No argument. And it quotes uh, <clears throat> that passage from Matthew chapter 4. As I reflect more as I reflect on more than 30 years of experience in intercession and spiritual warfare, I know that many times I have used the words, I bind you, Satan. And I have said things like, I come against you, Satan, or I come against the principality of abortion, or any other principality that happened to be our prayer focus. Never once did I think about the fact that he might have a legal right from the judge to be operating in the situation. If it, uh, it was presumptuous and dangerous for me to pray this way and unlawful. I was guilty of attacking principalities and powers because I was just blindly following what I had observed was the way to conduct spiritual warfare. As I commanded principalities and powers to be bound and rebuke them, I did not realize that I was actually attacking what God had put in place. She's getting real close to understanding sovereignty of God. Even though it was demonic, it still has permission of the judge because of sin in the area of its jurisdiction. Because of my dream, I have learned to keep the eye, the personal, the ego, out of the warfare. As discussed earlier, since the Lord is over all these principalities and powers, Satan is subject to authority of God. In some cases, rebuking Satan could be considered a rebellion against God's divine order. Phew, them's fighting words. Wonder how many of these she sells in the church. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Coming from her, perhaps, uh, perhaps some Christians will really learn something. I, I certainly hope so. Uh, I would recommend this book very highly. It's uh, very interesting uh, to, to see how she, uh, how she deals with all these things. And I like her emphasis on the word. Um, it's the word. Okay, From the Courtroom of Heaven by Jeanette Strauss, S-T-R-A-U-S-S, -S. Jeanette. Jeanette has two T's in it. From the, from the Courtroom of Heaven, and if you want the, the full title, uh, the subtitle here is To the Throne of Grace and Mercy. from the courtroom of heaven. It's a nice book because it's, uh, it's not like my big books. It's nice and thin. It's pretty easy to read and a lot of, a lot of it is, is just her story, her testimony, and, and how it actually, uh, how she actually succeeded uh, where she had been uh, frustrated for many years. Um, prior to that time. So she recognizes, like chapter 11, the battle is God's. It's, it's God's battle. And uh, it's, all, it's, it's, it's all about recognizing that God is the one who is doing this. It's not us. We don't have the power to do it. We get frustrated and so we think God needs a little help because, you know, he didn't answer right away or didn't give us the answer that we wanted. And so, so we tend to, to think that, uh, you know, maybe we can help God along a little bit or maybe God is waiting for us to do something. So we do a little flesh and that, of course, stimulates God to do something by the Spirit. I mean, we've all been there, huh? Um, but we learn by experience that this is not how God works. And if, if we want to be the enforcer on it, you know, on our own, God will let us do that. You know, but it's much better to let him do it. It may take a while, 10, 20, 30 years or more, or maybe 5,000 years, I don't know. It may take a long time, but it's always better to let him do it. It's better to let him do it. Uh, and. And so it's better not to take the case back on, our, on ourselves. On the other hand, I have also learned that, uh, that sometimes uh, after we have received a decree from, uh, from the Lord uh, or gotten the judgment, he's revealed to us, you won your case. Uh, he's passed the, you know, guilty, innocent, uh, uh, you know, uh, verdicts, once the verdict is passed, if you hear that verdict by the Spirit, very often it, you're the one that is called to then turn from facing the judge, where you are hearing what the verdict is, you turn and you face the other direction and decree that word. In so doing, though, you have to make sure it's not your own decree that you're decreeing. But if you speak the words that you hear him speak, everything's fine. If you do what you see him do, that's fine. Uh, but again, it comes down to some experience that we usually need in hearing his voice and then in being able not only to speak the words that he's speaking, but also to speak it with the intent and the character of the judge. In other words, speak the truth in love. So we see like in the case of Jonah, <clears throat> Jonah was called to deliver a word against Nineveh. In the big pageant that we saw, they had, they had a little bit of creative license in there. But they, uh, they portrayed Jonah as being uh, fatherless because the Assyrians from Nineveh had come, made war on Israel and had killed his father. And so they had this as a background. I thought that was quite, kind of interesting because then it, 
it, it was their way of explaining why Jonah was a bit reluctant to want Ninevites to be spared. You see, I mean, he had a personal stake in this, and the whole idea was how, how Jonah uh, was able to come in the end to a place of forgiveness where he could actually agree with God's verdict uh, and, uh, and, and be in favor of them repenting. Because throughout the whole book of Jonah, as well as in the pageant, you know, uh, Jonah was uh, hoping, hoping, hoping that God would bring judgment upon them and would not spare them. And so <clears throat> it occurred to me that this is, uh, in that sense, Jonah is not only a type of Christ in the sense of, you know, dying and being raised from the dead, you know, the belly of the whale and so on. Uh, but Jonah is also a type of the church. He's also the type of, ch he's really a type of church prophets. They really don't want the world to be saved. You see? Because if, if God would save everybody, then why am I trying to follow him? You know, I might as well go out and have a good time. And you know, every time they say that, I cringe. Because it exposes their heart. What they're really saying to God is, I wouldn't follow you if you were the last God on earth. The only reason I will follow you is because if I don't, ah, I'm going to get tortured forever. So because of your threats, I will follow you out of fear, but I really don't love you at all. That's really what they're saying. And yet they don't really understand what they're saying, and yet their heart is being made manifest. God has his ways of doing that. He tricks you into confessing uh, and exposing your heart. I've seen this so many times over the years. But with us, if, if the word of God has truly settled in our hearts, where it has begun to, to work within us and change us, we begin to come to the place where we, we want Nineveh to be saved. We want them to repent. We want them to experience what we did. We're not seeing them as the enemy. We're seeing them as future believers. But yet, so often today, I mean, you can see it in smaller scale. Uh, you know, you walk into some churches and, and they're praying, God, we ask that you would uh, nuke the Iranians, those bad guys over there who are trying to mistreat your people your true chosen people who have rejected Christ. You know, now that makes a lot of sense. And so, you know, I don't know. It seems to me if we, if we think that non-Christians are God's chosen people, we'll start to act like them. We take on their attitudes and don't even realize it. And we end up to be like Jonah, who was a nationalist prophet, he had a genuine calling. I don't dispute that. And yet, people even with a genuine calling are not necessarily manifesting the heart of God. That's two different things. We need to be aware of that ourselves. In fact, that is why we've had this cleansing the house per campaign uh, for the last uh, almost 76 days now. Okay? And it was interesting when God told us to, to do this, uh, pray for the cleansing of the house. It was only then that we discovered that it was 76 days to the end of this conference from then. So it's a 76 day prayer conference, prayer campaign. And I, it didn't even occur to me until we got here that Branson, Missouri is right on the main drag of Highway 76. I mean, who can make this stuff up? You know, the, the coincidences and, and, you know, I mean, it takes us a while to catch up to what God is saying and doing. But eventually, by the time it's all over, we can look back on it and we can say, okay, this wasn't my plan. This was God's plan. I had nothing to do with this. Uh, I mean, we've been planning this conference since uh, a year, about a year ago when we first started talking about it. But... It didn't occur to me that Highway 76 was the main drag through Branson. 
I had no idea. So God has his fingerprints all over this conference and, over, and his fingerprints on this particular time. And so we'll talk about this more uh, later, but cleansing the house, we're coming to the last uh, few days of this prayer campaign of cleansing the house. And uh, uh, the question then will be, okay, then what? Why are we cleansing the house? What is the purpose of this? Because obviously cleansing the house is preparation for something else. So we have been preparing our hearts for something else. And that's what we'll talk about next time. Okay? Thank you. Okay. Five minutes. Don't go, don't stray too far. Uh, stand up if you like. Don't walk more than 10 feet away. Unless you got to go to the boys' room or girls' room. <laughs>